This is the Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, day 209. Your calling is irrevocable. My father, like many Jews, never lived in Israel. The Jewish people are scattered all over the world. In 1948, the state of Israel was re-established. Around nine and a half million people live in Israel today, of whom nearly seven million are Jews. There are many other Jews still scattered around the world today. I like how Eugene Peterson translates the New Testament passage for today using the term insiders for the Jewish people and outsiders for the non-Jewish people. Many individual Jews over the years have become Christians. In fact, all the very earliest Christians were Jewish insiders. But now the vast majority of Christians are non-Jewish outsiders. What does the future hold for the insiders? The key to Paul's understanding lies in Romans 11.29. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. This is a theme that runs throughout the Bible as we see in today's passages. From Psalm 89 Once you spoke in a vision to your faithful people you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have raised up a young man from among the people. I have found David my servant. With my sacred oil I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my Saviour. And I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne, as long as the heavens endure. God's covenant with his people will last forever. We see in the covenant with David that God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. God called a young man from among his people. He gave him gifts, he bestowed strength, he anointed him. He promised that his love would be with him and that he would maintain that love to him forever. My covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. This promise was originally given to David and repeated many times. Then later in the book of Isaiah, what was promised to David is promised to Israel. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Paul shows clearly that all this has been fulfilled in Jesus. He writes, we tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled in us, their children, by raising up Jesus. He goes on to quote Isaiah 55 verse 3. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. God promises that he will maintain his love for you forever and that through Jesus you inherit all the blessings promised to David. You are loved. You are anointed. He will give you strength. Your calling is irrevocable. Father, thank you for your faithful love. Today I call out to you. You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Saviour. New Testament from Romans 11 Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression... Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, 
then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in amongst the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of their unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. God's promise to Israel will prevail. As we've seen in Romans 11, Paul is answering the question, has God rejected his people? His answer is no, no, no. God's gift and his call are irrevocable. God's gift and God's call are under full warranty, never cancelled, never rescinded. Yet Paul still grapples with the apparent reality that most have not accepted Jesus. He speaks about them stumbling and experiencing a hardening. They are now like olive branches that have been broken off. How can this fit with the unbreakable promises that he's made to the people of God in the Old Testament? First, this hardening was only partial. There has always been a remnant chosen by grace. Second, the hardening was fruitful since it led to riches for the Gentiles. When they walked out, they left the door open and the outsiders walked in. Third, the hardening was temporary. Are they out of this for good? And the answer is a clear-cut no. This hardness on the part of insider Israel towards God is temporary. Now, if their leaving triggered his worldwide coming of non-Jewish outsiders to God's kingdom, just imagine the effect of their coming back. What a homecoming! This last point is particularly important to Paul, who cares passionately about his people. He eagerly anticipates the full inclusion of the people of Israel. He goes on to say that all Israel will be saved. He does not say if this happens, but when this happens. He uses an olive tree as a picture of the Jewish nation. Christ came, the nation rejected him, the tree was chopped down, but the roots were left. The gardener grafts in the Gentiles. The time is coming when the Jewish branches will be grafted back. Then the whole tree will be complete. The Gentiles grow up out of the stump. They do not support the root, the Jews, but the root supports them. There are three successive stages in fulfillment of the divine plan of salvation. First, unbelief of the greater part of Israel. Some of the tree's branches were pruned. Second, inclusion of many outsiders through faith in Jesus. You, wild olive shoots, were grafted in. Third, salvation of all Israel. But what does all Israel will be saved mean? Some have argued that it means Israel 
can still be saved apart from Christ. However, this position is not credible. Paul has argued throughout the letter that Jesus is the way of salvation. Others have argued that it meant the whole nation of Israel, including every single member, will put their faith in Jesus. However, all Israel is a recurring expression in the Old Testament and other Jewish literature, where it need not mean every Jew without a single exception, but Israel as a whole. This also fits with the context of what Paul is saying here in Romans. Paul is considering God's dealing with the nation as a whole. Thus, their fullness is to be understood in the same sense as the fullness of the Gentiles. The large-scale conversion of the Gentile world is to be followed by the large-scale conversion of Israel. Paul concludes, There was a time, not so long ago, when you were on the outs with God. But then the Jews slammed the door on him and things opened up for you. Now they're on the outs. But with the door held wide open for you, they have a way back in. In one way or another, God makes sure that we all experience what it means to be outside so that he can personally open the door and welcome us back in. Thank you, Lord, that the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. I pray that we will soon see not only a large-scale conversion of the Gentile world, but also a large-scale conversion of the people of Israel. Old Testament from 1 Chronicles 4 and 5 Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm, so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Kelab, Shuha's brother, was the father of Miha, who was the father of Eshton. Eshton was the father of beth Repha, Peziah, and Tehina the father of ur These were the men of Rika. The sons of Kenaz, Othniel and Sariah. The sons of Othniel, Hathath and Mionathai. Mionathai was the father of Ophrah. Sariah was the father of Joab, the father of Jeharashim. It was called this because its people were skilled workers. The sons of Caleb, son of Jephune, Iru, Elah, and Naam, the son of Elah, Kenaz, the sons of Jehalalel, Ziph, Zipha, Tiria, and Aserel, the sons of Ezra, Jetha, Mered, Epha, and Jalon. One of Mered's wives gave birth to Miriam, Shammai and Ishba, the father of Eshtemoa. His wife from the tribe of Judah gave birth to Jered, the father of Jedor, Heba, the father of Soko, and Jekuthiel, the father of Zenoah. These were the children of Pharaoh's daughter, Bithiah, whom Mered had married. The sons of Hadiah's wife, the sister of Naham. The father of Keilah, the Garmite, and Eshtemoa, the Maacathite. The sons of Shimon, Amnon, Rina, Ben-Hanan, and Tylon. The descendants of Ishai, Zoheth, and Ben-Zoheth. The sons of Shelah, son of Judah, Ur, the father of Lika, Leada, the father of Marasha, and the clans of the linen workers at Beth Ashpia, Jochem, the men of Koseba, and Joash, and Seraph, who ruled in Moab, and Jeshubai Lehem. These records are from ancient times. They were the potters who lived at Nataim and Gedira. They stayed there and worked for the king. The descendants of Simeon, Nemuel, Jamin, Jerib, Zira, and Sheol. Shalom was Sheol's son, Mipsam his son, and Mishma his son. The descendants of Mishma, Hamuel his son, Zakua his son, and Shimei his son. Shimei had sixteen sons and six daughters, but his brothers did not have many children, so their entire clan did not become as numerous as the people of Judah. They lived in Beersheba, Molada, Hazashuel, Bilha, Ezem, Tolad, Bethuel, Horma, Ziklag, Beth Markaboth, Hazasuhim, Beth Birai, and Shearaim. These were their towns until the reign of David. Their surrounding villages were Etam, Ain, Rimon, Token, and Ashan, five towns. 
and all the villages around these towns as far as Beala. These were their settlements, and they kept a genealogical record. Meshobab, Jamlech, Josha, son of Amaziah, Joel, Jehu, son of Josabiah, the son of Sariah, the son of Asiel. Also, Elioenai, Jeacobah, Jeshoshiah, Asiah, Adiel, Jesimiel, Beniah, and Sizer, son of Shiphai, the son of Alon, the son of Jediah, the son of Shimrai, the son of Shemaiah. The men listed above by name were leaders of their clans. Their families increased greatly, and they went to the outskirts of Jidor, to the east of the valley, in search of pasture for their flocks. They found rich, good pasture, and the land was spacious, peaceful, and quiet. Some Hamites had lived there formerly. The men whose names were listed came in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. They attacked the Hamites in their dwellings and also the Meunites who were there, and completely destroyed them, as is evident to this day. Then they settled in their place because there was pasture for their flocks. And five hundred of these Simeonites, led by Pelatiah, Neariah, Rephiah, and Aziel, the sons of Ishai, invaded the hill country of Seir. They killed the remaining Amalekites who had escaped, and they have lived there to this day. 1 Chronicles chapter 5 The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. He was the firstborn, but when he defiled his father's marriage bed, his rights as firstborn were given to the sons of Joseph, son of Israel. So he could not be listed in the genealogical record in accordance with his birthright. And though Judah was the strongest of his brothers and a ruler came from him, the rights of the firstborn belonged to Joseph. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The descendants of Joel. Shemaiah, his son. Gog, his son. Shimei, his son. Micah, his son. Reiha, his son. Baal, his son. And Beira, his son, whom tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, took into exile. Beira was a leader of the Reubenites. Their relatives by clans listed according to their genealogical records. Jael, the chief, Zechariah, and Bela, son of Azaz, the son of Shema, the son of Joel. They settled in the area from Aroa to Nebo and baal Meon. To the east, they occupied the land up to the edge of the desert that extends to the river Euphrates, because their livestock had increased in Gilead. During Saul's reign, they waged war against the Hagrites, who were defeated at their hands. They occupied the dwellings of the Hagrites throughout the entire region east of Gilead. The Gadites lived next to them in Bashan, as far as Salika. Joel was the chief, Shaphan the second, then Janai and Shaphat in Bashan. Their relatives by families were... Michael, Mashalam, Sheba, Jorai, Jachan, Siah, and Eber, seven in all. These were the sons of Abihael, son of Hurai, the son of Jeroah, the son of Gilead, the son of Michael, the son of Jeshisha, the son of Jado, the son of Buzz. Ahai, son of Abdiel, the son of Gunai, was head of their family. The Gadites lived in Gilead in Bashan and its outlying villages, and on all the pasture lands of Sharon as far as they extended. All these were entered in the genealogical records during the reigns of Jotham king of Judah and Jeroboam king of Israel. The Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had 44,760 men ready for military service. Able-bodied men who could handle shield and sword who could use a bow and who were trained for battle. They waged war against the Hagrites, Jetur, Nafish, and Nodab. They were helped in fighting them, and God delivered the Hagrites and all their allies into their hands, because they cried out to him during the battle. He answered their prayers, because they trusted in him. They seized the livestock of the Hagrites, 50,000 camels, 250,000 sheep, 
and 2,000 donkeys. They also took 100,000 people captive, and many others fell slain, because the battle was God's, and they occupied the land until the exile. The people of the half-tribe of Manasseh were numerous. They settled in the land from Bashan to Baal Hermon, that is, to Senia, Mount Hermon. These were the heads of their families, Ether, Ishai, Eliel, Azrael, Jeremiah, Hodaviah, and Jadiel. They were brave warriors, famous men, and heads of their families. But they were unfaithful to the God of their ancestors and prostituted themselves to the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, that is, tiglath pileser king of Assyria, who took the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh into exile. He took them to Hela, Habor, Hera, and the river of Gozan, where they are to this day. God's generous character and his blessings are unchanging. God is in ultimate control of history. His call and his gifts are irrevocable. What was fulfilled in the New Testament began in the Old. The chronicler traces the history of Israel from its very beginning. God is sovereign. The battle was God's. Does this mean that we are mere pawns? Are we simply pieces being moved around God's chessboard with no choice or free will? Not at all. You are involved in God's plans. Your actions make a difference for good or evil. First, resist acts of dishonor. Our actions can cause us to lose out on God's blessing. Though Reuben was Israel's firstborn, after he slept with his father's concubine, a defiling act, he lost his firstborn place in the family tree. He lost a great inheritance because he could not control his desires. We all need to take great care to resist temptation and not to allow the lust of the flesh or our emotions to cause us to miss out on a blessing from God. Second, be a person of honor. Jabez, on the other hand, was a man of honor. Jabez's prayer made a difference. Jabez prayed to the God of Israel, Bless me, oh, bless me. Give me land, large tracts of land and provide your personal protection. Don't let evil hurt me. God gave him what he asked. This is not the most unselfish prayer in the Bible, but nevertheless, God answered it. Jesus taught us to pray, among other things, give us today our daily bread. Our first concern should be God's glory, his kingdom and his will. But it's not wrong to ask for God's blessing, presence, protection, and healing in our own lives as well. Likewise, God gave his people victory because they cried out to him during the battle. He answered their prayers because they trusted in him. The battle is God's. He is in ultimate control. Nevertheless, your prayers make a difference. Lord, thank you that my calling is irrevocable. Thank you that the battle is yours. Thank you that my prayers make a difference. And Lord, I cry out to you for help today in the battles I face. Pepper adds, In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9, we read the prayer of Jabez. I probably spend far too much time praying for me and my family. Jabez's prayer also sounds rather egocentric. But nevertheless, God seems to have answered it.